Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, Episode 7. With me today is Todd Murray. Todd is here to talk today about what I'm going to refer to as creepy critters, um, for lack of a, a more encompassing term. We're going to talk about some of the creatures that tend to be, well, what people think of as creepy. Um, bats, spiders, things like that, and their role in the garden. Before Todd joins us, it's time to review what to do in the garden in November. As far as planning goes, you want to assess your outdoor spaces for areas that seem to be lacking trees or shrubs and start researching appropriate choices for that spot so that you can buy and plant the appropriate tree or shrub in the spring. It's time to force spring bulbs for indoor blooms in December, if that's something you choose to do. For maintenance, It's a good time to service your equipment, lawnmowers, weed eater, things like that. Clean them up. Make sure they, you know, if they need any maintenance like air filters or spark plugs, you can replace or check those and prepare them for winter storage. Personally, I like to add non-ethanol gas to our gas-powered tools. Um, We have a lot better success rate with them just uh, starting up without a lot of work come spring. It's also, you also want to check the potatoes that you have in storage and make sure to remove any that are going bad. And it's actually even a good idea to check any storage food that you have, squash, apples, anything you're storing from the garden and make sure to pull out anything that is going bad. Carrots and onions and garlic as well, because if you have one that's going bad or starting to sprout or something like that, it can affect the rest of your storage. If you haven't already, you can mulch rhubarb and asparagus. You can also make sure that you have drained and insulated your sprinkler systems or irrigation systems if you haven't done that already. Leave ornamental grasses in the winter to provide texture in the landscape. A lot of those ornamental grasses also provide seeds for birds during the winter. You want to wait until early spring to cut them back. Keep an eye out for drainage issues when in heavy fall rains. Uh, it's a good time to make note and photograph and keep track of those areas that do drain poorly so that they can be addressed in spring. It's a good time to prune your roses, uh, primarily the tea roses and hybrid roses, to prevent winter damage. If you want more information on how to prepare your garden for winter, Bonnie Orr was with us in episode five, and she goes over this in depth and talks about the differences in preparing for Western or Eastern Washington and how tall to cut your roses and how deep to plant your fall, your spring bulbs and things like that. And I will link to that in the show notes. It's a good time to check firewood for insect infestations. If you have infestations, burn the affected wood first, but don't store it inside. Treat peaches four weeks after leaf fall for leaf curl or shot hole diseases. Monitor lawnscape plants for problems, but don't treat unless you can verify there is a problem. November is a great time to repot amaryllis from last year. Water it and keep it in a warm, bright area and fertilize lightly when it begins to show growth. And it's also time to reduce fertilizer applications in house plants or uh, indoor gardening spaces and reduce that watering as well. All right, that covers the November gardening calendar. Let's switch over to our discussion with Todd. Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to warn you that I get pretty excited talking about creepy critters and master gardeners. So if I start going on and on and on, you're going to have to figure out how to get me back on track. Okay. 
Well, let's start off then. Um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your connection to the Master Gardener program? Well, um, I I am a big um, fan of the Master Gardener program, and let me explain that a little bit. My history with the program really realized almost it's going almost 20 plus years ago. And it was the Master Gardener program that helped me really understand what an institute like WSU does and its role in the community. And I graduated from Washington State University with a master's degree in entomology and knew that I wanted to uh, work in an industry to help people manage and understand kind of the world around them and bugs are everywhere. And so it seemed like a good place to start. And early on in my career, I, I met the master gardeners up in Whatcom County. There, Whatcom County was experiencing a really unusual problem with a uh, new invasive species that's been here for quite some time. And, and, and the public generated habits around dealing with this this problem and it's called the european crane fly it decimated lawns when it first came to washington state and so people got in the habit of of treating their lawns with pesticides in bellingham the drinking water comes from uh, uh, lake wacom and there's lawns surrounding lake wacom and they started picking up pesticides showing up in the drinking water you know the the water source for the city and so we uh, trained master gardeners how to survey lawns for crane flies and deployed them throughout that neighborhood and and challenged the neighborhood that if you think you have a crane fly problem, contact the master gardener and they'll come test your lawn and teach you how you can test your own lawn. In a few years of doing that, master gardeners never found any crane fly problems and were able to convince many of those homeowners that normally would apply a pesticide um, to not use pesticides that would then maybe run off into the drinking water. And, and so that was a really powerful example for me of how important a group like the Master Gardeners are for a community. And I was so jazzed by it that I was like, I want to work for WSU and have been working for WSU ever since and just celebrated my 25th year with the organization. Wow, that's great. That's a great example of you know, how to making the public aware of about IPM or what we now think of as IPM and, you know, the, the possible implications in our drinking water. Talking about creepy critters. All right. So how we start with um, how can gardeners distinguish between harmful and beneficial critters in their gardens? That's a great question. And that's where understanding our role in our yards becomes really important because because it's hard to distinguish good and bad sometimes. You know, sometimes ladybugs are really good because they eat aphids and then they become really bad when they start overwintering in your house by the thousands. Or earwigs are really good because they're generalist predators in your garden, but then when things get kind of dry, they start taking big bites out of your dahlias and, and other flowers and causing a damage. And and so I always, I always like trying to understand who I'm encountering in my garden without attributing a good and bad to it, because there's always a role that all these organisms play in our yard. And, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, pests deserve to be in your yard or anything like that. You know, you, you want to get rid of your pests, but I think it's really important to understand your relationship with that organism and then what you're trying to accomplish. Cause, cause as a master gardener, We've found that master gardeners are really key in in helping people with one of the most critical steps of integrated pest management, and that's um, managing their own expectations of their yard. You know, so some people have a idea of a yard that should be a certain way, and often that's not what our yard provides us. So it helps kind of develop a tolerance to some pests that might not be causing all that much damage to your plants, you just might not like them. And, and so that basic understanding of, of understanding the pests, I think, are, are really important. But a great general rule of thumb is if, if it moves fast, it's probably 
beneficial to some degree or benign. Um, and, and that's just a common attribute of a lot of the beneficial organisms out there is they, they're fast movers. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rule, but if you flip over a rock and you see a beetle scurry away really fast, chances are that's a ground beetle or a staphylinid beetle, which are beneficial. That's good to know. I, <laughs> but the ones that move fast are the ones that are more likely to startle you and <laughs> make you think twice. If we're going to talk about creepy critters, maybe we could start talking to some spiders. I think most people generally know spiders are beneficial. Uh, in most ways, um, in the garden. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget the first time I saw, what is it? I think it's just called a common garden spider. It's black with yellow, bright yellow. And it was really big, <laughs> bigger mm-hmm. than I'm used to. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm yeah. like, okay, I have to find out what that is because it kind of creeped me out. So I guess what I'm asking, as far as, so spiders as an example, you know, what are some of the benefits or what are some of the the beneficial aspects that they offer to your garden health. Spiders are a great reason that I always check in with myself on why I live in the Pacific Northwest. It's a place of paradise. We don't have a lot of dangerous things that live here. And and so even, even like mosquitoes aren't that bad here. So, so as a general statement, it is rare that any gardener will encounter a dangerous spider in their yard. You, we do have black widows that occur on the east side. Sometimes we get them on the west side, but it's very rare. Um, but we don't have poisonous spiders in the state. Um, so we, we get a reputation of brown recluse spiders, but those don't occur here and likely won't anytime soon. And we also have found out that hobo spiders are are not causing the the black nasty lesions that they previously got blamed for. So, so the first thing is to know that chances are, if you're experiencing a spider in your yard, it's not going to hurt you. So that automatically throws it into the beneficial um, place because spiders are exclusively predaceous. And that's all they're doing is running around trying to cram whatever they can in their mouths in your yard. And so they'll take care of a lot of your insect pests and other arthropod pests that you have in your yard. All right. So how about bats? Oh, bats are good. Bats. How, so what are some of the beneficial aspects of bats in your, in your yard or in your garden? The beneficial aspect of bats is when you have bat activity in your yard, if you're lucky enough to, um, not only is it very entertaining to go watch them at dusk, but they are so good at vacuuming up flying insects, especially during those dusk hours, and can make a pretty good impact on some pest species like moths like that might lay eggs on your cabbage or brassicas and and so those dusk flying moths they're great at at catching a bunch of those in the air and eating them um so they're they're almost like aerial vacuum cleaners if you have them active in in your yard and great at at um bringing down some of those flying insect pests snakes that was the next one i wanted to talk about so snakes snakes are another good reason to re- yeah, yeah the, the, why the Pacific Northwest is such a great place to live. We do have rattlesnakes on the east side, and, and those folks that do garden on the east side are, are likely aware of how to, how to um, work around rattlesnakes and recognize them when you see them. But um, other than that, though, we don't have a lot of um, venomous snakes that you need to worry about in, in your yards in Washington State. Uh, snakes are great predators of, especially when they're young, of other types of of things that could be pests. Sometimes even insects. They're they're good at feeding on insects when they're young, uh, but as they mature, they're great at feeding on some of the more mammal mammal problems that you might experience, like mice, maybe even rats. We we do have some larger snakes in in the area that might be able to take a rat. Um, but they're they're harmless. Again, if you're in a place with rattlesnakes, you're probably well aware of how to recognize and avoid those. But 
but we don't have any really other poisonous snakes here. And, and all, like spiders, all the snakes are predaceous to, to some degree. And, and so they're out there feeding on other animals and often sometimes pests. So what are some of the less common, I mean, most people are familiar with their garter snake. It's a very benign snake, but are there many other varieties that maybe we see less often in our gardens that we could be aware of? Uh, that's a great question. Garter snakes, I th- and I think there are a few different species of them uh, that generally look the same, uh, especially in Western Washington, are most common in people's yards. There is a, um, a boa that lives here, and I've seen a, a boa in my garden, and they are fascinating. They're beautiful snakes. Again, they aren't uh, poisonous and and uh, generally beneficial. And uh, this was when I lived in the Columbia River Gorge. We would get boas in in our uh, garden, and they're they're a treat to run across. They're small, but they're a boa constrictor, and and uh, have that similar behavior and biology and so forth. So, so we do get some unusual snakes in the area, but garter snakes are what most people are going to run across. If you live by water bodies, uh, we have some other snakes that are specific to living on riparian areas and water edges that can sometimes look like a, you know, rattlesnake type um, snake, but they aren't venomous and nor do they have rattles. And, and so those will often be encountered by people that live around kind of fresh water bodies. We're taking a quick break to tell you all about the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program's Endowed Chair Campaign. WSU Extension Master Gardeners use knowledge to empower healthy and resilient communities. But what if we could do more? The WSU Extension Master Gardener Program is raising $1.5 million to hire a horticulture professor fully dedicated to the program and to the volunteers who give their time and talents. This professor, or endowed faculty chair, will teach new and existing WSU Extension Master Gardeners cutting-edge horticulture and environmental stewardship in perpetuity. They will create tools to support volunteer outreach, such as publications and fact sheets. They'll represent the program locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally, and partner and collaborate with like-minded organizations to leverage program strengths. And finally, they will conduct meaningful research and develop robust curricula that will build upon our program and find solutions to address difficult challenges like pollinator decline, increasing number of wildfires, food security, and climate change. Learn how your gift will support a greener, healthier Washington when you give to the WSU Extension Master Gardener Endowed Chair Fund at mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash how hyphen to hyphen donate. Links will be in the show notes for this episode. So are there any precautions that gardeners should take to protect themselves from bites or stings when encountering certain critters? I would say just it's a good practice as a gardener, even though we don't have many poisonous um, insects or animals in our area, is it's always good to shake out your shoes, shake out your gardening gloves before you, um, you know, stick your foot or hand in there. Because often, you know, if if there is a spider in there, it doesn't have a choice but uh, to sink its fangs into you if it can um, while you're, you're stepping on it or sticking your hand in its face. So, so it's always good to shake those out. And we do have scorpions that live in the state, uh, especially on the east side. That's why it is good practice if you store your crocs or whatever outside is to shake them out first. Um, but we also do have a scorpion that, that can show up pretty, in some cases, pretty frequently on the west side too. And it's a pretty large scorpion. In, in some of the wooded areas. Again, down in the Columbia River Gorge, we'd see that scorpion quite a bit. And, and I've found some in my own boots before. And so it's just a good reminder to, to shake out your boots before you put them on. Oh, I had no idea we had scorpions. I think of that as a desert, you know, like <laughs> Southwest desert. <laughs> so the bigger ones are not the ones you have to worry about, right? Well, the, the I mean they'll pack a they'll pack a wall up like a yellow jacket, so it'll still hurt, but they aren't they aren't deadly like some of the scorpions you get in some of the tropical areas. Um, but we we've, we've found scorpions up in Linden, which is up in Whatcom County. Again, down in the Columbia River uh, Gorge, we've found them quite quite easily down there too. One critter that most people probably have and don't like. 
um, that I didn't really mention earlier, but uh, rats in the garden. What, oh, yeah. you know, what kind yeah. of harm can a rat do? And, and you know, are, do they have any benefits? <laughs> in Western Washington and in some locations in Eastern Washington, we do have rat problems. And gardeners can help reduce the magnitude of those problems by just maintaining a tidy yard in the sense of picking up fallen fruit, making sure ripening fruit's picked, and and don't let fruit get amassed and spoiled. It's also really important to rat proof your compost piles and and try and keep rats from from going there as a regular place where they know that they can get some some food in. So general sanitation is really good. Bird feeders are also a great uh, thing to make sure you clean up after. Don't let excessive bird seed accumulate underneath. Um, that's a great way to attract rats. Um, but rats are definitely an animal that's worthwhile paying attention to in your yard and garden to make sure that you're not uh, contributing to the overall problem. But in some of our urban areas, they are definitely a uh, force and, and um, it's good to deter them as, as, as much as possible. Are there any ongoing conservation or research efforts related to some of these critters like spiders or bats or that you know of? There is. You know, in, in, in the entomology world, probably the most beneficial insects that, that we spend most of our time studying and, and understanding are is this group that's kind of more of a functional group called parasitoids. And parasitoids are most commonly uh, wasps of a, some sort, uh, but we do have fly species that are considered as parasitoids. And parasitoids truly have a gruesome lifestyle. They're a cross between a predator and a parasite. And what they're really good at is specializing on a host group. So an aphid parasitoid will only feed on certain kinds of aphids, and so they have to specialize on that group. So they're very specific. And because of that, they can impact those populations and population sizes. And they're gruesome in the sense that a free-living wasp will fly around. Once they find a host that might be suitable, often that wasp will use a modified stinger called an ovipositor, and probe that that um, poor insect to see if it's suitable host for its babies or not. If it is, she'll insert that ovipositor, drop an egg or maybe a bunch of eggs inside that host. Those eggs will hatch, and as those eggs hatch, they'll they'll develop into a grub, um, sometimes really unusual alien-looking thing that floats around that insect's body and robs nutrients from that insect. Once that grub is developed enough and it's ready to start to increase its life cycle and complete its life cycle, it will then start feeding on more important organs uh, within the host or on the host and, and eventually kill that host. And, and then pupate and emerge as an adult parasitoid to go do the whole cycle over again. And so as a gardener, it's really important to start recognizing when you have parasitoids active in your yard because those are, those are things that you want to keep around. And a great example is if you've ever looked on your rose bush and you saw kind of these inflated, big, crusty aphids, that, and if you look closer, you might see a perfect hole chewed through it. And, and those are a good sign of mummified aphids that have been parasitized. And so that's a good sign that you have parasitoids active. Wow. So how likely are we to find parasitoids in our gardens? I mean, is it pretty routine and it's just a matter of being able to identify it? Yes. Yes. Parasitoids are extremely common. Most of them are very small. Each stage of an insect's life cycle will have parasitoids that specialize on those stages. So we have parasitoids, they only look like little yellow jackets, but they're teeny, teeny, tiny that feed on insect eggs. We have some that are specialized on insect larvae or nymphs. And then we have some that even all go after the, the pupae. 
And and so you're guaranteed right this very moment, whether you're it's middle of summer, or middle of winter, you got parasitoids somewhere in your yard. And and they're there all the time. They're the more significant biological natural control force of other insects out there. And and when we see insect outbreaks, often that outbreak um, subsides once those parasitoids come back and in decent enough numbers and, and they'll regulate that insect's population. Is there a way to encourage parasitoids in the garden? That's a great question. There are. Parasitoids are very small and predators for this case also, if you can provide uh, flowers of uh diversity of sizes and blooming times and nectar production, pollen production, all of the parasitoids and most of the predators too will utilize uh, pollen and nectaries in their adult stage at, at some point. So, so it's really good to have a uh, diversity of, of blooming flowers throughout the season if you can and all different shapes and sizes of flowers to attract that diversity. If you have problems with aphids, I'm a huge fan of planting nasturtiums in my yard. Nasturtiums attract uh, bean aphids, like I haven't seen a nasturtium without bean aphids before, but they can tolerate bean aphids really well. And, and if you get aphids in your yard, you know you're going to have parasitoids in your yard. And if you have parasitoids in your yard, that will um, help also manage other types of aphids that will come into your yard. And, and so they're, they're a nice repository for, for at least aphid parasitoids. Okay. So how about beetles? Can we talk about some of the beneficial beetles? And I'm, are there many that are harmful or in Washington? Beetles are a humongous group, and so we have a lot of beetles that can be seen as pests in our yard, and we also have a lot of beetles that are beneficial. The most commonly beneficial beetle that most people are familiar with are ladybird beetles, and those are excellent uh, predators to have acti active in your yard. Um, one of the oohs and ahs of a ladybug is that a single individual can eat up to 5,000 insect prey items in their lifetime, and that's a lot of bugs that they can eat. So if you get a few ladybird beetle larvae on your roses, that will probably clean up your aphid problem on your roses. And, and so those are great ones to have around. Carabid beetles, or also known as uh, ground beetles, uh, along with staphylinid beetles, are very good uh ground dwelling predators that will be scurrying around your your soil line gobbling up any insect items that they might run across some of them even specialize on slugs and snails so so it's great to have those in your yard and and help uh keep some of the slugs and snails at bay and there's ways that you can attract beetles into your yard and provide those habitats and and what they like are just like anything else, they like uh, food, water, and shelter, and, and anything that you can provide in a non-disruptive landscape that won't, you know, you're not going to till the soil much or anything. Um, keep, a, keep a little beetle bank handy in your yard, and, and they'll colonize that and, and move out from there. Some of the practices, though, are really important, and when I think of my time at the Master Gardeners, we used to stress pesticide use and, and mixing the right amount of pesticides for your yard before you used it. And, and if you over mixed pesticides, we used to recommend you go ahead and spray out the rest of your hand spray or whatever onto the soil line, you know, like underneath your roadies. And, and essentially that was a recommendation that was, you know, dependent on the product used was probably killing a lot of ground beetles. And so we were able to then go back and, and look at our education and then come up with better ways to teach gardeners how to mix the exact appropriate amount of product so you don't have that problem of having excess and having to dispose of that. And, and that was a much better way just overall to teach master gardeners and, and also um, reduce the, the unintended consequences of, of using um, pesticides in our yard. So are there any other 
critters that are typically not liked by gardeners? I mean, you know, just because they think they're creepy or gross that um, we <laughs> should depends, touch on? It depends on what gardener you're talking to. Like, gardeners are are the whole range of attitudes towards creepy crawlies in their yard. So some gardeners think that anything that's an insect is a creepy crawly. And that's what I love about the Master Gardener program. It's because the program helps gardeners understand what they're seeing in their yard. And and I have found the best way to overcome someone's fear of a creepy crawly is to teach them about it and understand what that creepy crawly is really doing. And then they identify it with a little bit different uh, attitude and, and may even um, land on the side of not thinking that they're creepy crawlies anymore, that they're, that they're this important bug that comes to visit my yard pretty regularly. Yeah. I, I've gotten better over the years, but I do still find every once in a while I'm like, oh, I don't want that in my garden. It doesn't. No, that's, that. that's fine. <laughs> Even though it's probably just fine. It's all right. Well, not to complete. Well, yeah, to completely switch gears here, uh, Master Gardener Endowed Professor Chair that uh, we were trying to raise money for. And as I learned, you are do hold an endowed professorship in integrated pest management, correct? Mm-hmm. Did I get yes. that right? Yes, that is. Okay. So I thought it would be good to get your perspective on what an endowed chair position would have to offer the Master Gardener program. An endowed chair position for the Master Gardener program shows the commitment that WSU has to that program along with the value that the overall society has for the master gardener program. So it's a, it's a, it's a really neat joint relationship that solidifies what the program does and looks like in the future. Right now, WSU has no obligation to staff a master gardener program. And we have very few faculty that are assigned to the program because of so many competing needs in the state. An endowed position will lock in a a faculty position to always be dedicated to the Master Gardener program, which I believe the program deserves. And and it's a challenge for WSU when there are so many competing needs in the state and so many areas of the state that we're not serving uh, based on those needs. It's hard for an institute like WSU to always come up with the resources to support the Master Gardener program, even though it wants to. So so an endowed position really locks the Institute into an agreement that it will support the Master Gardener program with a faculty position and with a staff position, making this one a really unique, unique uh, endowment request. And, and it's uh, for the amount of money needed to reach the goal to uh, solidify the agreement in the broad terms is a drop in the bucket. WSU will spend much more money, much, much more money than the endowment cost on that faculty person and the program um, with that small, small donation gift. And, and so it's, it's a formal way to really lock both the industry and, and the value of the master gardener program to exist for as long as, as um, the Institute exists. Great. Yeah. I think a lot of people kind of have trouble wrapping their brains about around what an endowed position, you know, has to offer just because it's a new concept to master gardeners, even though yeah. it's been a practice of WC for quite some time. The other aspect of an endowment is, is there is a level of accountability of the position And so while master gardeners don't decide whether a faculty gets tenure or not, they do help inform whether that, that person holding the endowment is, is meeting their needs. And, and that type of feedback from the constituent group is really important. So for my position, 
I regularly meet with with my stakeholders and and get that feedback and make sure I'm orienting my programming to to help help meet their needs. So so the conduit of the endowment just further gives the community of master gardeners a voice into how the program's going. All right. So is there anything else you would like to add about creepy critters or the endowment before we wrap up? I I don't really have anything specific to add about creepy critters or the endowment, but I can't express more how important the Master Gardener program is to people like me who've dedicated their careers to an institute like WSU because of, of volunteers like those listening right now. And it's, it's, sure has given me a lot of personal meaning in my career and life on on what I want to contribute and and help out with and the master gardener program is truly inspirational in a way that I've never seen other programs function at at a institute like Washington State University so much so it's it's spread to all the other states and even a few other countries so I just appreciate everybody listening and and the value that they've added to to the program just by their time and interest and their enthusiasm for gardening and getting people outside and learning about their yards. It's it's a it's a really amazing program. You guys make such a huge difference in everybody's life. Well, thank you very much. And we appreciate you being here and and sharing creepy critters and maybe making them a little less creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with master gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a master gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.